guys, welcome back to the library. Today we are going to, wait, 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 wait. Good morning, library patrons, it's Sunday. Today I'm going to be doing a book review of Turtles All the Way Down by John Green. Spoiler alert, I am going to go through the whole book and all its themes, and I definitely will give away the ending, so if you haven't read this book yet, read it, it's great, and then come back and we'll talk about what it means for us. This video also will include a little bit of mental health information because May is National Mental Health Awareness Month. Specifically, we're going to be talking about OCD or Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. But first, let me give you a little bit of a backstory on the author John Green. John Green is a well-known and respected author of An Abundance of Catherines, Looking for Alaska, Half of Will Grayson, Will Grayson, One Third of Let It Snow, and has had two of his books made into movies. Those two bestsellers were The Fault in Our Stars and Paper Towns. But he is also known as one half of the Vlog Brothers on YouTube. John and his brother Hank started a YouTube channel to keep in touch via weekly pen pal letters in video form. The Green Brothers are also involved in several other channels which focus on education, like SciShow, Crash Course, Mental Floss, The Art Assignment, Sexplanations, and others. Oh, and also a gaming channel. Turtles All the Way Down is John Green's newest book, which talks about a girl named Aza Holmes who is trying to solve a mystery while also living with obsessive compulsive disorder. The basic summary of the book is, 16-year-old Aza never intended to pursue a mystery of fugitive billionaire Russell Pickett, but there's a $100,000 reward at stake and her best and most fearless friend Daisy is eager to investigate. So together, they navigate the short distance and broad divides that separate them from Russell Pickett's son, Davis. Aza is trying. She is trying to be a good daughter, a good friend, a good student, and maybe even a good detective, while also living within the ever-tightening spiral of her own thoughts. It is interesting to read because John Green has OCD in real life, and he struggles with it every day. So you can see what it's really like inside his head and what it's like to live with mental illness. Before I get into the book, I want to give you a little bit of a brief overview of OCD and how it works. That way you can really understand what it's like for Aza Holmes. Obsessive compulsive disorder is just how it sounds. There are obsessions and compulsions. The obsessions come as intrusive thoughts that, you know, what if my house burns down? You know, I think I, I, think I left the stove on. Did I leave the stove on? Hmm. And then you have the compulsions, which is, I'm going to go check if the stove is on. And you actually go and do the thing that temporarily relieves the anxiety, but ultimately just makes it worse because it's an ever-spinning cycle of what John Green calls a thought spiral, where you can't get these thoughts out of your head, so you have to keep checking. Checking is one of the types of OCD, but there are actually several different types that you can have. I'm using the book, the OCD workbook, and it says that there are different types, including the checking like we already talked about, also the washing and cleaning, where people are concerned that they're going to be contaminated by something, and they have to wash their hands often and clean things and be careful what they eat. This is what Aza has. Aza's OCD comes in the form of her having this open scab on her finger that she puts a bandage on, and she questions, you know, I don't want it to get infected, maybe I should change the bandage. Maybe I should like drain the pus out of it and then let it heal again. Uh, maybe, and it's the thought spiral which goes over and over and she'll break it open, drain it, put a new band-aid on it and then a few minutes later want to do it again because she's so obsessed with the thought that she might get some kind of bacteria in her and get really sick. So that's the washing and cleaning type. There's also the ordering and repeating type where everything needs to be symmetrical or have a just right feeling. You may have to count things to a certain number in order to feel satisfying. Then there's a category which this book calls scrupulosity, which is about religious, ethical, and moral issues, where you think you're being followed around by demons or that you're a terrible person for the thoughts that you have, and really you're a pretty normal person with intrusive thoughts that aren't even you. And there's hoarding, which is where you collect all kinds of stuff because you don't want to let go of anything because you think it's all going to be important someday. And you end up with mounds of just junk around your house. Those are the main categories of OCD. You can have more than one category at one time, but like I said, A's is primarily concerned with contamination and cleaning. Okay, now we're gonna get into some deep talk about the book. I really love how Aza portrays the voice of the OCD in her mind as a different entity. She calls it a demon 
who is trying to put thoughts into her head that she doesn't want to accept, but usually the demon ends up winning. A good example of this is on page 128. John Green makes it two separate voices, and he does this by um, writing Asus in normal font, and then the demon is in italics. I was pretty sure I had changed the band-aid right after waking up, just before I brushed my teeth, but the thought was insistent. I don't think you changed it. I think this is last night's band-aid. Well, it's not last night's band-aid because I definitely changed it at lunch. Did you though? I think so. You think so? I'm pretty sure. And the wound is open. Which was true. It hadn't scabbed over yet. And you left the same band-aid on for God. Probably 37 hours by now, just let it fester inside the wrong moist old band-aid. I glanced down at the band-aid. It looked new. Didn't. I think I did. Are you sure? No, but that's actually progress if I'm not checking it every five minutes. Yeah, progress towards an infection. I'll do it at the bank. It's probably already too late. That's ridiculous. Once the infection is in your bloodstream, Stop that, makes no sense, it's not even red or swollen. You know it doesn't have to be- Please just stop! I will change it at the bank! You know I'm right! But the one I really love is on page 225. She is fighting with this demon while in the hospital and trying not to get infected by hospital bacteria. So her and this demon are going at it. She says, no, I'm not gonna do it. He says, you have to. She says, no, I don't. Yes, you do. But then, when you get towards the bottom of the page, she has completely given up fighting. You've already got it. Stop, please God, stop. You'll never be free of this. You'll never be free of this. You'll never get yourself back. You'll never get yourself back. Do you want to die of this? Do you want to die of this? Because you will. You will. You will. You will. And now her thoughts matched the demon's thoughts. It won her over the thought spiral. She just couldn't stop thinking about it. And by the end of it, she makes the conclusion, I knew how disgusting it was. I knew. I knew now for sure. I wasn't possessed by a demon. I was the demon. Ouch. When I heard that, I actually got up and threw my book. Can we just take a second to make a side note that John Green is very good at talking like a 16-year-old girl. He can write like a high school girl because it's hip and funny and sarcastic, very young and relatable, even though he's like 40. John Green also calls into question in the book not being able to control your own head, not being the author of your life story, as Aza talks about, or as he has said in a video, Am I actually the captain of this ship I call myself? One of the themes that comes up in the story a lot is money. Aza's in a middle-class home, she's a normal girl. Her best friend Daisy is poorer and actually struggles to get along. And the boy she's going after, Davis, is a millionaire's son. And the book explores all of the different ranges and how Daisy wants to be where Davis is, but Davis is tired of his life because of the way his dad, the one who went missing, treats him and doesn't mind giving lots of money away. And Aza's still right in the middle there, but there's one passage where Daisy really drives home that Aza doesn't understand what it's like for her to live with such poverty. They actually fight it out, page 216, Daisy yells this to Aza. You have no you. It's also I mean, you think you and your mom are poor or whatever, but you got braces, you got a car and a laptop and all that shit. And you think it's natural. You think it's just normal to have a house with your own room and a mom who helps you with your homework. You don't think you're privileged, but you have everything. You don't know what it's like for me, and you don't ask. I share a room with my annoying eight-year-old sister whose name you don't know, and then you judge me for buying a car instead of saving it for college, but you don't know. You want me to be some selfless, proper heroine who's too good for money, but that's <laughs> Holmesy, being poor doesn't purify you or whatever it just sucks. You don't know my life. You haven't taken the time to find out, and you don't get to judge me. Another thing that comes up is the role of father figures. Davis's father, the millionaire, who goes missing, was completely neglectful of Davis. And Davis, everyone thinks he has the perfect life because he has all this money, but he had such a neglectful father and he feels so abandoned. Aza loved her father so much 
and she holds on to whatever she has left of her father, but her father died and left in a much different way. They had a loving relationship, but he died, unfortunately. Davis and Russell Pickett did not get along, and then Russell Pickett ran off in some kind of scandal so that he would escape jail time for fraud. Davis is actually relieved when his father goes missing, and Davis's little brother Noah needs a father figure so badly that he's just crying and depressed, and Davis is now stepping up to be his father figure and take care of him. Oh, and did I mention the inheritance? Uh, his father gave all of the inheritance to his pet lizard. Okay, he wasn't a lizard, he was a Tuatara, but you get the idea. Something that I found interesting was Aza's relationship with Davis and how it was a mutual friendship that was not romantic, yet they did try doing romantic things without being involved. Aza wants him, but she doesn't know why, and she's afraid of that side of her. On page 42, Aza talks all about how she doesn't want to be in a relationship. She's not looking to date anyone. Parts of typical romantic relationships that made me anxious included 1. Kissing 2. Having to say the right things to avoid hurt feelings 3. Saying more wrong things while trying to apologize 4. Being at the movie theater together and feeling obligated to hold hands even after your hands have become sweaty and sweat starts to mix together and 5. The part where they say, what are you thinking about? And they want you to be like, I'm thinking about you, darling. But you're actually thinking about how cows literally could not survive if it weren't for the bacteria in their gut. And how that sort of means that cows do not exist as independent life forms. But that's not really something you can say out loud. So you're ultimately forced to choose between lying and seeming weird. When her and Davis try to kiss, she, can, she wants to kiss him. She kisses him, and then she has to go to the bathroom and clean her mouth out. Because, ugh, boy germs. So there is this love between them where they can just lay next to each other and look at the stars, but they aren't going out. So Daisy writes fan fiction, specifically fan fiction about Star Wars. And in some of these fan fictions, there's a character who she's secretly writing Aza's character because she's very passive aggressively mad at Aza. And this character that she writes in Aza's image is a real downer. Uh, she's just always full of anxiety, and she ruins the fun because she brings the mood down, and she used the term mustard, meaning, you know what, I better just read that section. It's on page 217. When she says she's like mustard, she means mustard is good in small quantities, like on a hot dog, but just a ton of mustard, it's too much. You don't want that much mustard. And she's saying she doesn't want that much of Aza in her life because Aza can be a little bit overwhelming. And Aza rebuttals with, I'm sorry it's not fun hanging out with me because I'm stuck in my head so much, but imagine being actually stuck inside my head with no way out and no way to ever take a break from it, because that's my life. To use Michael's clever little analogy, imagining eating nothing but mustard, being stuck with mustard all the time. And if you hate me so much, then stop asking me to. And I'm not gonna tell you what happens after that, because it is, it is good. Well, actually, it is terrible. So I'm gonna share some quotes with you. These are just random parts of the book that I find interesting that I really loved. First of all, there is on page 45 where she talks about intrusive thoughts. I have these thoughts that Dr. Karen Sai calls intrusives, but the first time she said it, I heard invasives, which I like better because like invasive weeds, these thoughts seem to arrive at my biosphere from some faraway land, and then they spread out of control. Supposedly, everyone has them. You look out from over a bridge or whatever, and it occurs to you out of nowhere that you could just jump. And then, if you're most people, you think, well, that was a weird thought, and move on with your life. But for some people, the invasive can kind of take over, crowding out all the other thoughts until it's the only one you're able to have, the thought you're perpetually either thinking or distracting yourself from. Also, page 243, Daisy and Aza are talking about the river that they live by and how they built a city around the river. Aza says, I think maybe I'm like the White River, non-navigable. That's not the point of the story, Holmesy. The point of the story is they built the city anyway, you know? You work with what you have. You have this river and they managed to build an okay city around it. Not a great city, maybe, but not bad. You're not the river, you're the city. So I'm not bad? Correct, you're a solid B plus. 
If you could build a B plus city with C minus geography, that's pretty great. Back on pages 244 to 245, they explain why the book is called Turtles All the Way Down. Daisy asks Aza, do you just like hate yourself? Do you hate being yourself? There's no self to hate. It's like when I look into myself, there's no actual me. Just a bunch of thoughts and behaviors and circumstances. And a lot of them just don't feel like they're mine. They're not things I want to think or do or whatever. And when I look for the, like, real me, I never find it. It's like those nesting dolls, you know? The ones that are hollow, and when you open them up, there's a smaller doll inside, and you keep opening hollow dolls until eventually you get to the smallest one, and it's solid all the way through. But with me, I don't think there is one that's solid. They just keep getting smaller. That reminds me of a story my mom tells, Daisy said. What story? I could hear her teeth chattering when she talked, but neither of us wanted to stop looking up at the lattice of the sky. Okay, so there's this scientist, and he's giving a lecture to a huge audience about the history of the Earth. And he explains that the Earth was formed billions of years ago from a cloud of cosmic dust. And then, for a while, the Earth was very hot, but then it cooled enough for oceans to form. And single-celled life emerged in the oceans. And then over billions of years, life got more abundant and complex, until 250,000 or so years ago, humans evolved, and we started using more advanced tools, and then eventually built spaceships and everything. So he gives this whole presentation about the history of Earth and life on it, and then at the end, he asks if there are any questions. An old woman in the back raises her hand and says, that's all fine and good, Mr. Scientist, but the truth is, the Earth is a flat plane resting on the back of a giant turtle. The scientist decides to have a bit of fun with the woman and responds, Well, but if that's so, what is the giant turtle standing upon? And the woman says, It is standing upon the shell of another giant turtle. And now the scientist is frustrated and he says, Well, then what is that turtle standing upon? And the woman says, Sir, don't you understand? It's turtles all the way down. I laughed. It's turtles all the way down. It's turtles all the way down, Holmesy. You're trying to find the turtle at the bottom of the pile, but that's not how it works. Because it's turtles all the way down, I said again, feeling something akin to spiritual revelation. Aza adds a few pages later, I started thinking about turtles all the way down. I was thinking that maybe the old lady and the scientist were both right. Like, the world is billions of years old, and life is a product of nucleotide mutation and everything, but the world is also the stories we tell about it. 280, near the end of the book. As I washed and rebandaged it in the bathroom, I stared at myself. I would always be like this. Always have this within me. There was no beating it. I would never slay the dragon because the dragon was also me. Myself and the disease were knotted together for life. I was thinking about Davis's journal, of that frost quote. In three words, I can sum up everything I've learned about life. It goes on. Yes, you may never escape fully. But there is still hope. The books I used for this video were very helpful, and I put other links about mental health in the description. If you think you or a loved one has OCD or any mental illness, I encourage you to get the help you need by seeing a doctor or a therapist or attending a support group. It really helps. I also encourage everyone to read Turtles All the Way Down and check out John Green on YouTube. Thanks for watching. See you guys.